that comfort to us. So we thank God for you today. But I want to begin with a sila moment. Now, those of you who have heard me on the radio know that I always end my messages with the phrase sila, think and act on these things. But I want to begin this message with the phrase sila this today. I want you to think carefully, not on what you've just heard, although I want you to do that as well, but in connection with our theme today, I want you to think carefully on what you have heard before. You've heard, in fact, the theme of this conference is the unfinished task. Isn't that right? Now I want you to think carefully about that statement. You've heard that the church has not yet completed its task of reaching the world for Christ. You've heard that, haven't you? You've heard that we still have an unfinished task. The task of taking the gospel to all the world. Now, think for a moment. Who has given us the command to accomplish this task? It is Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Does Jesus have the authority to give us this command? I believe so. Listen to the words that we call the Great Commission or the, great, or the mandate of the church. Matthew 28. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Notice, not some authority, but all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That covers everywhere. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them so, to observe all that I command you, and, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That is, to the end of the completion of the task. He is with us from the beginning to the end. This isn't a task that we are to do alone. So then, not only does he have authority, Scripture tells us he has all authority. Now, do we have the power to accomplish this task? Yes, we do. In fact, in the same passage, he says, Lo, I am with you always. He is with us, helping us to accomplish this task. There's no doubt about that. But also in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and you know that verse well. It says, you will receive what? Power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. Do we have the power to accomplish the task that was given to us by the one who has all authority? Yes, we do. We have the power within us, and upon us. We have the power of the risen Christ, and we have the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. So we have the authority, all authority. We have the power, all power, to accomplish the task. So, let me ask you a question then. Why is it that after 2,045 years of being on earth, that the church has still not finish the task. Why is the task still unfinished? Although we have all the authority behind us, we have all the power behind us, why hasn't the task been accomplished? Is it lack of money? I don't think so. God's people has got a lot of money. God has given to God's people a lot of money. Doreen talked about the cattle on the thousand hills and all the gold and all the silver. Isn't that? that right? He has it. Now, like she also said, though, it's probably still in your pockets or your fine book, and you need to release it. But money isn't the problem. It's our holding on to it, our hoarding God's money that is the problem. So the money is there, the power is there, the authority is there. What about the personnel? 
What about the people? Do we have the personnel, the people to do it? Yes, we do. You know, uh, I don't know if I had the slide up there. Do we have the slide there with the numbers of people being reached? I'm not sure. I had a problem getting this done last night. But you know, it's been determined by the MICA project that 46% of the people in the world have not yet been reached. 46% have not heard the gospel. That's quite a bit. However, it also says that the church right now is doing a wonderful job of getting the word out. The word has gone in some form or fashion in almost every language of the world. Not all, but almost. And it is believed that those that are still lacking it will not necessarily get the written word, but will have people who speak the word to them. That's why they're looking for storytellers today rather than for translators. All right? But that's a new thing here. And the idea is you tell somebody the story, and that person will tell somebody else the story. And as we're going to see this morning, that's the key to getting the gospel out to the whole world. All right? But yes, we have the money, we have the people. God's people are all over the world. God's people have got money. They just got to release it. And God's people have just got to do what God wants them to do in order to finish the task. Now, so we have all of these things. We have the authority. We have the power. We have the money. We have the manpower, the personnel. Why is it then that this task is still unfinished? I believe it's because we have misread the mandate. And therefore, we've been focusing our money and our manpower on the wrong part of the commission. To put it succinctly, I believe that we have been, focus on, we have been focusing on making converts rather than focusing on making disciples. And listen carefully now. The Great Commission does not command us to make converts. It commands us to make disciples. And we have misread the meaning of this text. I really believe that. So let's look at the text. Let's look at the mandate a little more closely. Now, actually, Matthew 28 is only one of about five or more statements given in the Bible concerning what we call the Great Commission or the mandate of the church. We have it in the book of Acts. We have it in the Gospels uh, over and over again. Now, in order to get a good grasp of what the Great Commission is, we need to synthesize all of these statements in Scripture. I've done that, and this is what you'll get. You'll get that the goal of the Commission is to make disciples, not make converts. You'll also get the idea that there are steps in achieving the goal. The goal first is to preach the gospel, that's evangelization. To baptize those who believe, that's what I call incorporation. Teach them all things. That's indoctrination. The authority behind the commission is Jesus Christ himself. That's taught in both Matthew and Luke and John. The geographic extent of the Great Commission is from home to the othermost parts of the earth. In other words, you start from where you are and you go to where you're not. That's the idea of getting the word out. The ethnic scope of the commission is people of all ethnic backgrounds. That's the meaning of the Greek term ethnos that is translated all nations. It means people of different ethnic origins. The power to fulfill the commission, as we said, is the Holy Spirit. The time extent of the commission is to the end of the age or until Jesus returns or until the mandate is finished. Now we have a problem, by the way, as to the ending of the commission as far as the church is concerned. This is a theological thing I want you to think about. We began here reading today about the gospel has to go to all the nations and then the end will come. Now think carefully of that for those of you who believe in the rapture. If you believe in the rapture, you cannot be believing that the gospel have to go to the ends of the earth before Jesus Christ comes. Because Jesus Christ could come in right now, today. You understand what I'm saying? So you have to see the context within God's purpose for the church. If it is true that Jesus Christ could come today and you believe in the rapture and the gospel has not yet been reached, then something is wrong there. You understand what I'm saying? So we have to see it in its proper context, and I'll deal with that as we go. Here's my point. Evangelism, which we put so much emphasis on, is the first stage or step in fulfilling the Great Commission. It is not 
the end of the commission. The text says make. That word itself gives the idea of a process. It's Jesus says, I will what? Build my church. That's what the Great Commission says. I want you to make disciples. That's what the church is made up of. The disciples are being made through the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a process. It's not a one-time thing where a person comes to accept Christ, and that's the end of the mandate. That's the end of the Great Commission. That's not it. It's possible for us to evangelize the world and still the mandate would not be completed because the disciples have not been made. Do you understand what I'm saying? That means you've got to understand what a, true, what a true disciple is. Not everybody who says they are Christians are disciples, true disciples. In fact, not all disciples are true disciples. And it's only true disciples who can, in fact, carry forth the Great Commission. Because true disciples become disciple makers. And unless you are a disciple maker, you're not a true disciple. Because becoming a disciple maker is an inherent part of being a true disciple. In other words, being a maker of disciple is in the gene of a true disciple. You understand what I'm saying? You cannot be a true disciple unless you are making disciples. That's the key. And that's why I believe we've missed it. That's right. I believe it for over 2,000 years we have missed it. And we're going to see that if we followed the idea of making disciples as presented in scriptures, the world could be met in 10 generations rather than 2,000 years. But let's go on. I want to read you uh, a statement that Dr. George Peters made. He was, when he was alive, was known as the Dean of World Missions. He was one of our professors at Dallas Theological Seminary. And he was talking about missions and what it means to go out giving everything for Christ and talking about discipleship. Just let me quote what Dr. Peters had to say about being a true disciple. A Christian disciple is more than a believer. A disciple is more than a learner in the ordinary sense of the world, word. A disciple is more than a follower or imitator of Jesus Christ. Yea, even more than one who lives in full devotion to the Lord. A disciple is a believing person living a life of conscious and constant identification with the Lord in life, death, and resurrection through words, behavior, attitudes, motives, and purpose, fully realizing Christ's absolute ownership of his life, joyfully embracing the, the saviorhood of Christ, delighting in the lordship of Christ, and living in the abiding, indwelling resources of Christ according to the imprinted pattern and purpose of Christ for the chief end of glorifying his Lord and Savior. There are divine fullness and content in the concept of discipleship which we must not limit. End of quote. You see, I don't think we have appreciated really what the Bible talks about when it talks about discipleship. For instance, most of the time you, today you talk about people teaching a discipleship class or teaching disciples. They'll talk about memorizing scripture, how to pray, how to be sure of his salvation, how to witness, and all of those things. Those are good, but go into the Bible and find out what Jesus himself says about disciples. He says that you cannot be my disciple unless you what? Take up your cross and follow me. He says, you cannot be a disciple now. Regardless of everything, that's an absolute statement. You cannot. Now, what is taking up the cross? Well, back then when it was written, if anybody had a cross on their back, they, you knew they were headed for death. Right? Suffering. In other words, read all of Jesus must for being a disciple. You must hate mother and father. Let me put it like this. You must... Love me more than you hate, more than you love your mother and father. Is that right? Now that's, that's, he's trying to compare love here. He's saying that when it comes to love, our love for Christ must look, it, it would be like when you compare it with the love you have for your parents, it, the, our love for them would be as hate when compared to the love we should have for Jesus Christ. We must love him with all of our hearts and all of our life, all of our being, everything, complete absolute love for Christ. That's one of the must of being a disciple. And then he said, you must deny yourself. Didn't he say that? 
Now, some people think of denial of self, the term, well, it's coming around now for uh, Ash Wednesday and so on, so I'm going to give up ice cream for Lent. I'm going to give up smoking for Lent. And that's denying self. That's not what the Bible talks about when you deny yourself. He's talking about self-denial. You deny everything that you say is yours, and you turn it over completely and absolutely to Jesus Christ. That's what a true disciple is. Today we're we'll talking about following Christ. Come to Christ, you can get rich. You can live in a big house. You can have all kinds of things. God will give you everything you want. Jesus doesn't teach that. He says you come to Christ and all you can get is pain and trouble and all you're going to do is have heartaches. He teaches that. Then you follow him. But we don't teach that kind of a thing today. That's why I say we have lost the true concept of what it means to be a true disciple. We are not making disciples that follow Christ. We are making converts that follow a church or an organization. And we've got to avoid, we've got to stop that. Now, when you look at the Great Commission in Matthew 28, go ye therefore unto all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, and so on. There's only one command in that gospel, and it is not go. The command there is make disciples. Now, it's amazing. If you go back and you look at all commentaries up to 20 years ago, you will never see that emphasized. But in the last 15 years or so, you will see that all Bible commentators now are getting a fresh look at that. The command is not to go. The command is to make disciples. The idea is that as you are going, make disciples. The idea is wherever you are at any time, what you're supposed to be doing as a disciple of Jesus Christ is making other disciples. That's the thrust of the passage. And it's important for us to understand that. You see, we like to talk about let's challenge people to go. Go where? Well, go to Africa, go to Haiti, go to China and you'll be a missionary. No, we need to challenge our people to go next door. We need our child. If you're going to be, if you are going to be disciples, if you're going to be true disciples, you've got to begin where you are. We have people who are trying to train to go on short-term missions and, and missions and so on. They've never led anybody to Christ. They don't know what it is to confront another person concerning why they believe what they believe, but they want to go away to be a missions, and they cannot do it at home. That's not a true disciple, all right? So the goal or objective of the Great Commission is to make true disciples, people who are willing to give up everything. You see, true disciples don't have to be forced into giving up anything for missions. They do it readily because it's in their genes. If you have problems in giving to win people to Jesus Christ, you better check to see whether you have been one to Christ. It's in our genes that we're willing to give whatever it takes to have a soul come to Jesus Christ as Savior. Now, listen carefully here now. The Great Commission is not fulfilled until new converts are turned into true disciples. And true disciples are disciple makers. Listen once again to what it says in Matthew. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples, or as you are going, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the end of the age. Listen to that very carefully. The text is actually saying, as you go, or wherever you are, really is the more, I think, accurate statement here. Wherever you are, make disciples. How do you do that? By baptizing them. That's incorporating them into the body of Christ. And by teaching them everything Jesus has said. It's amazing how many Christians, people come and raise their hands and say, I'm saved. And then they never taught the word of God. They never taught what Jesus taught. It's just another crowd. Well, we want 20 people today. 20 people signed the card. That's it. We've done our job. No, you haven't. You've started it, but you haven't finished. You see, that to me is the unfinished task. 
the unfinished task is making disciples. We have converts, but we don't have disciples. And that's where we have to put the emphasis. Now, it's amazing, though, when you go to the epistles, you cannot even find the word disciple in the epistles. It's amazing. That's why I started to write a paper why I said, I believe that discipleship is the wrong approach to teaching new believers. Because when you go to the New Testament, the idea of discipleship is transferred into the idea of maturing as a Christian. Maturity rather than simply learning certain things. And once you've accomplished that, you've arrived. That's not the idea. It's a growth. It's a maturing. And you need certain things to be taught you at the right time in your period of growth. In other words, a baby just born, you're not going to feed them Kung salad. Isn't that right? You're not even going to feed them grits. They can't take it at that age. But they go on, and at a certain time, you've got to stop feeding them milk, and you give them grits. When you get a little mature, you get them Kung salad. But everywhere and every age period, they have to have certain kinds of food to help them grow in that age bracket. That's what we've missed out in our disciple making. We've looked at everybody as a convert rather than a disciple. You understand? And so the teaching is always how you know you save. How you can lead a person to Christ. Those are important things. But if that's all you know about being a Christian, you're not growing. You started in your growth. It's amazing, you know, in doing a study on this, you come to Hebrews and the writer of the, the, to the book of Hebrews actually says, your knowledge concerning Melchizedek indicates whether or not you're a mature Christian or not. How many of you have heard the name Melchizedek? How many know about him, what it really means, the significance of Melchizedek in the book of Hebrews? Very few. But you read the book of Hebrews, and Paul says, listen, he's not Paul, whoever the author was, was writing. He says, now I got many other things I want to tell you, especially about Melchizedek, but you can't bear them. He says, you should be teachers, but you're still babes, you need somebody to teach you. We cannot stay in that period. We cannot fulfill the mandate of the Great Commission unless we make converts rather than being satisfied. I'm sorry, make disciples rather than being satisfied with converts. All right? Now, let, let me read you another passage of Scripture to show you how Paul deals with discipleship in the, in the epistles. Ephesians 4. It was Christ who gave some to be apostles, and not the kind of apostles you hear about today, all right, is a different thing. Who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, notice now, so that the body of Christ may be built up. Now notice, who's doing the building up? It's the members. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become what? Mature. See that? We become mature. It is a growth as it goes on. The leaders in the church are to equip God's people so God's people could cause the church to grow. Notice now, it's the people in the assembly who causes the growth of the assembly, not somebody coming from outside. Not that that doesn't happen, mind you, but the key is here for God's people who gather together to use their gifts in such a way that the church is built up. That's how disciples are made. Notice he says, Then we no longer will be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of men in deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, that's Christ, the whole body, that's you and me, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, listen to now, grows and builds itself up. Notice that? Grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. This is why I say every true disciple has the gene of disciple making within him. This is what he's talking about. Every part does its work. The church grows. The church grows both inwardly and outwardly. 
But the point is, you have got to be using what God has given you to, in order for that to accomplish. Notice carefully in this passage, the primary function of church leaders is to equip individual members to affect the maturity of the body as a whole, as well as the individual believer. When we as leaders do what we're supposed to do, you then are going to do what you're supposed to do. And that will automatically lead to disciple makers, because that's what a disciple is, a disciple maker. All right? It is God's divine and purpose that all believers become a tour or true disciples of Jesus Christ. Achieving this purpose is the primary purpose for the ministry of the leaders of the church. Notice also that it is the members who cause the growth of the church, and that is my point. It is the members who cause it. It's a self-growth uh, type of a thing. This, in fact, is the process of discipleship. A true disciple is a maker of disciples. For a true disciple, then, evangelism is a way of life. That's how we are to complete the Great Commission, by making disciples who make disciples. Evangelism is, is in the genes of a true disciple, as I've said before. That's what we have in Scripture. I am convinced, then, that one of the main reasons why we do not have as many true disciples or mature disciples as we should today in our churches is because, for the most part, pastors and other church leaders either do not know or have forgotten that the producing of such disciples is the major and overriding purpose of our being in the ministry in the first place. You see, when people ask us, how is the church going? Uh, you shouldn't say, well, we had 10 new members this week. Or we had 20 people baptized. Now, those are good things. But we should say, well, you know, last week I saw John. John was a lying gambler. He's a treat his wife bad. But you know something? Now, he's a man of integrity. He loves his family. And all he does is seek their best for the glory of God. In other words, it's the change in an individual's life, maturing in Christ, that tells us whether or not our ministry is effective, not how many people we get. And so even Bible verses, those are good. Now, please don't get me wrong. Those are good. But we have a lot of people who know Bible verses, but really when they come right down to it, their life is terrible. They, they lie at work, they cheat at work, they cheat with their wife, they cheat with their husband, they abuse their children. You know what I'm saying? But they could repeat all the verses you want. They can even tell you all the books of the Bible in order, which I have forgotten to do myself. I can't even do that now. But it's amazing how many of our children could tell you how many books are in the Bible or how many Gospels we have, but we cannot tell you what the Gospel teaches. You see, we don't want content. We don't want to teach disciples. We just want to make converts rather than disciples. So we've got to change that focus, you see. Maturity in Christ, then, is what we should aim for. And that can only happen as each individual does the work that God has given through the gifts he's given in their lives. Now, what happens when, it is, when an, a church is doing this? By the way, a local church is one of the probably the most important institutions that you can join, you could be a part of. God's purpose in the world today really is not to send individuals all over the world, but it's established congregations all over the world. You see, congregations that make disciples. Now, when you do that, according to the scriptures there, according to Ephesians 4, you'll come to unity in the faith. That's doctrinal truth. To be unity in the knowledge of Christ. In other words, you become Christ-like. In verse 14, you become stable in your doctrine. In verses 15 and 16, you practice the truth in a loving way. And then you become, partic you become active participants in the ministry of the church. That's an evidence of a maturing church when these things are present. And this, these can only be present when we seek to make disciples rather than make converts. Now, when we do this, 
the growth occurs in three areas. Growth appears in three areas. First, there's inward or qualitative growth. This comes to spiritual edification or proper instruction in the Word of God by spirit-equipped pastor teachers. Now notice that. I say spirit-equipped pastor teachers. I think it's time for us to get out of this idea that you let anybody preach in the pulpit. It's their time this week. You're a member of the board, so you're supposed to preach. That's not biblical. The only people who should be feeding and making disciples are people who have been gifted by God to do the job. We have too much foolishness going on in the pulpit. Just turn on your radio and see. I mean, it's just amazing. You see? It's too much foolishness. You have to have people who are gifted to teach the Word of God to do that. And when you do that, you'll have people who become disciple makers. All right? So there's that inward qualitative growth. And that is essential for outward growth. The reason why we do not have the missionaries as we should is because we're failing in our job and building our people up in the way they should be built up in the church. Begins in the home, in the home, the home church. So the first growth is inward and qualitative. But then that automatically leads to the outward quantitative growth. This is the result of what I call spontaneous, natural evangelism, evangelism on part of all members of the church who are true disciples. If you are equipped by the word properly, you will be out running people to Christ every day, all the time. Wherever you go, wherever you are, you will be make, trying to make disciples. It's just an automatic response to what it means to be a part of a body that is being equipped by people who are gifted of God. That's what you see. That's the tra strategy in the New Testament. But then, not only is there inward growth, spiritual growth, and outward growth as people win people and bring them in. By the way, that's another thing. You talked to let me show you if you could determine whether or not you're growing as a Christian. Somebody wants to know Christ. Rather than you leading him, you say, well, hey, let me go take him so you could talk to Pastor Lyle. You're not a mature believer. You understand what I'm saying? If you've got to take somebody to be led to Christ by your pastor, now there's nothing wrong with that, mind you, but if you're doing it because you can't, something's wrong with that. You understand what I'm saying? So it's important for us to see that as well. The, my point is, the outward growth comes as a result of an inward growth where we mature. And that gene within us tells us that we've got to share our faith. Then there's also what I call upward qualitative growth, which results in and generated by genuine worship in the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ. In other words, as this happens... The thing that automatically happens is that the people of God, true disciples, become worshipers. Because if there's one thing that all children of God should know how to do, is how to worship. Now today we got all kinds of definitions for worship. You have to come here 11 o'clock to worship. And you got to be sure, thank you, oh, 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 no worship it, oh, the band. All the singers, now they're great, and I appreciate them. But if you got to depend on them to worship, you are in serious trouble. You understand what I'm saying? One of the marks of a true disciple is a worshiper, being a worshiper. That's why I tell our folk at Calvary Bible Church, if there's one thing I want to be known for at Calvary Bible Church, is that I taught you and I modeled how to worship. Because I believe that is the chief end of man, as the catechism says, to worship God. See? Worship. We have all kinds of classes on how to save money, how to lose weight. <laughs> when last have you had a class on what it talks about worship? What is worship? You see, sometimes we think worship is only what we do at certain times. But when you study scriptures, worship is a way of life. Everything you and I do is an expression of worship. And... It's important for us to realize that if we approach our life with everything that we do as an act of worship, it'll change us. When this truth first hit me, I started a regular ritual. That's right. I believe in rituals as a Christian. Every morning when I get up, the first words I say and before I put my feet on the ground is, God, 
I present to you the members of my body as instruments of righteousness. Use me for your glory today. And I walk on the floor from then on, believing that everything I do or say is in the will of God, unless I deliberately go contrary to what I know is wrong. That's why even right here, I believe I'm in the will of God right now. All right? To me, this is an act of worship. This is not a job. This is an act of worship on my part. And we have got to understand that. We have to, going back to uh, a phrase by an old believer, we have to learn to practice the presence of God. Let me give you an example again, personal example of that. When I was, well, I used to swim on Paradise Island. I used to swim from the hotel up to the cove and back. It took me an hour and ten minutes. And I had it planned. Going up, I praise. Coming down, I petition. That's what I do. Well, one day I was coming down, and I remember I was really focusing. I was praising. In fact, I didn't start the petition. I just was praising both ways. Coming back, when I got opposite the Ocean Club, as I was focusing on God, I really felt like he was there swimming with me. In fact, this is true now. I actually looked around to see if anybody was there. That's how real his presence was with me that day. Right there in the water, like God was swimming with me. See, I was trying, I was learning to practice the presence of God. And that's what a true disciple does. And when you make a disciple, you will make an individual who wants the same thing you do. Which what? Go and win somebody else to Christ and teach them to be worshippers. One of the big problems I think we have in our church is that when a young person becomes saved, the first thing he says, you've got to go out and witness. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. I think the first thing we should try to teach them is to learn to teach them what it means to worship the God that they came to trust. That's how we make true disciples. Do you want to test whether or not the task is still going on in your church? Look at it. How many worshipers do you have? Are you a worshiper? Are you a disciple who is making other disciples who would worship the one that you came to worship as well? And so there's a lot more we could go on, but let me conclude with this. The local church achieves, and by the way, the only authoritative agency for accomplishing God's will in the world today is the local church, not the individual. It's the individual within the context of a local church. You cannot grow to maturity by yourself. You need the people of God. That's why the local church is so important. All right? <coughs> The local church achieves its ultimate purpose of glorying the Father, glorifying the Father or the triune God by associating itself with Christ. Remember Christ says, I'm with you. We cannot go here doing things that we feel we want to do for our benefit without checking from the head to see if this is what he wants to be a part of our local church. The local church achieves its ultimate purpose of glorifying the Father by associating itself with Christ in the completing of his ministry on earth to the evangelization of the lost and the discipling of believers so that, it become, so that they become Christ-like in character and in action. To, parify, to paraphrase the well-known catechism, that's the chief end of the church. That's how the unfinished task could be finished. By the people of God becoming true disciples who make disciples who worship the triune God. Sila, think and act on these things. <laughs> well, I thank Pastor Lee for his ministry of the word. We also want to invite you, we have been a little negligent in getting it across to you over the email. Um, there's a special service today at 4 o'clock at East Street Gospel Chapel where um, 
many of the leaders of the Brethren Church will be being honored, and uh, you are invited to be a part of that. Pastor Lee will be the featured speaker there as well. That's, huh? Yes, we'll pray that he's able to make it. Um, that's at 4 o'clock today, East Street Gospel Chapel. Uh, Pastor Rex is being honored, I believe. Are you being honored as well? No? Okay. Uh, we want you to be a part of that, so please try to make it. But we're going to have the musicians uh, um, help us in our commitment time, and I'm going to ask Pastor Lee just to pray for you, and we will end our service with the benediction. All right, just have a seat, Pastor Lee. Musicians? Let's all stand as we Pastor Lee has helped us with a proper perspective about how the unfinished task can take place. It begins with us recognizing the call is to that of being a disciple. A disciple makes disciples. A disciple has it in his DNA. Perhaps today you felt that the Lord has really ministered to you. He's gotten his word across in a way that's been profound. You would like some prayer right now as you are continuing to make uh, step to be that full disciple for the Lord Jesus Christ. You've been a convert for too long. You're recognizing that God is calling you to be a disciple through whom he will get the unfinished tasks completed, at least as far as you're concerned. If you'd like uh, further prayer about that, I invite you to join uh, us up at the front. I'm inviting Pastor Lee to pray for you. Come quickly. Our service is over, but our service to the Lord continues. Come forward as Pastor Lee would pray for you. Pastor Lee. Our Father, <clears throat> we come to you in the name of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. And we thank you, our Father, that you loved us so much that you were willing to give your best for us. Thank you for being such a good God. It's because of his blood shed on Calvary's cross that we approach you today that we can come into your presence without fear of judgment or condemnation or rejection because you see us covered by the blood of Christ and clothed in his righteousness. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of your word and the fact that our primary purpose for being on earth is to glorify the triune God. Help us, our Father, to do that in every area of our life at all times. Lord, sometimes we make mistakes in our lives. We start out wrong. We do things that we shouldn't do, thinking that it's the things that we should do. So give us wisdom and the courage to change when we have to. Lord, you have spoken to individuals today as you've spoken to me from your word in different areas. We pray now for the enabling work of your Holy Spirit to continue to encourage and to build up in those areas of needs and to supply the needs 
in each one of the lives of the individuals who have indicated today that you have spoken to them. Lord, we pray that there might be a real transformation in their thinking and in their lives. And we may see each one truly to become a true disciple, a maker of disciples. Grandfather, that they might be mighty in accomplishing the unfinished task. We pray that each of us as individuals might truly learn to be worshippers of the triune God, to realize that our entire life is an act of worship. Everything we do, everything we say is an offering to you. Help us to be vividly aware of that fact every day of our lives. Now grant that these individuals who have come up today may truly experience your power, your presence in their lives. May this commitment that they make today be one that changes them in such a way that they become Christ-like, true disciples and true worshippers of the triune God. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Our missions services continue on Tuesday at 7 o'clock with the Council Time of the One and the Word of Life Clubs on Wednesday. Our Know Your Missionary Through Prayer Emphasis. And then we reconvene next Sunday at 6.30 for combined adult Sunday school class and then the 11 o'clock service. May the Lord bless and keep you. May his face shine upon you and may he grant you his peace. Our service is over, but your service to the Lord continues. Go serve the Lord. We invite our guests to join us upstairs for a moment of light refreshments. Refreshments have been prepared and the only one missing is you. Join us for